were dead in the middle of February, and the forecast is for 68 degrees. What is going on this winter? We have a reporter really looking at the science of the winter of 22-23, because we've never seen anything quite like it. It's Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Lisa Garvin, Laura Johnston, and fresh from City Council budget hearings, City Hall reporter Courtney Astolfi. We're hoping to have a nice conversation about that toward the end of the podcast. First up, though, we've got a reading war. Or do we have a reading war in Ohio? Is it phonics versus, well, whatever not phonics is? How did Governor Mike DeWine pour gasoline on this fiery debate with his proposed budget, Laura? So if the buzzwords are battling, and I hate calling anything to do with education a war, but it's the science of reading versus whole language or balanced literacy. So DeWine is squarely in the science of reading camp. That requires students to break down words into parts and sound them out, incorporates phonics and vocabulary lessons. And then there's the balanced literacy or whole language. That is actually... Uh, championed by Ohio State is one of the biggest proponents. It encourages students when they encounter a word they don't know to look at the book's pictures, consider the context, sentence structure, and the word's letters to figure out what they mean. So DeWine has put $162 million into his budget for the next two years. Obviously, that's not passed yet. But to get to the science of reading instructional approach into all of Ohio's public schools, we don't really know how many Ohio schools are using which program, and most schools are probably using a combination of both. But what DeWine is looking at is the state proficiency test. That's that third grade reading guarantee, which isn't really a guarantee anymore. I think the legislature took the teeth out of it. But just 60.1% of third grade students in Ohio scored proficient or higher on their reading, which is a pretty sad state. I have an interesting perspective on this because when I lived in Florida, I'm married to a teacher And she became, in Florida, a reading recovery teacher, which all came from Ohio State. Ohio State University Uh, took this whole philosophy from wherever it was, New Zealand, and sold it to the rest of the country. And so the, the whole creation of reading recovery was to catch the kids for whom other reading methods weren't working. Mm -hmm. Phonics wasn't working. This was, it's called recovery. It's a kid that had fallen behind. It has expanded usually when we moved to Ohio, she wasn't a reading recovery teacher anymore. So she's been out of it, but it's, but it's big in the district that she's in, in Solon, but it doesn't work for everybody. It, it, it's one where, where phonics might not work for some kids. Reading recovery might not work for some kids. I don't know why it has to be a battle it, why can't it be personalize the reading instruction to the needs of the student? Figure out what's going to get them there and use that. Why does it have to be fist on the table? Jeb Bush is big in the anti-reading recovery kind of method. I completely agree with you. And I think the fact that most schools are using a combination of both shows that they're looking for what works with each kid. But you have to start with something, right? You have to pick which program your school is going to follow to, to start the process and and goes from grade to grade. I mean, it's not like you can pick one in first grade and a different one in second grade. These are programs and curriculum that all the teachers are following and they need to be trained in. And then if it doesn't work for some kids, then you find something else. I My kids used foundations. It was like, that. you know, they spelled it obviously like it was fun, like reading was fun and they learned phonics. And I never knew what a digraph was until my kids came home with these these worksheets, right? And a digraph is a, a combination sound like shh or th. And, and I'm like, I'm learning grammar and phonics along with my kids. But I know that it didn't work for some kids. And then they use this Wilson method. So I think most schools are trying a lot of things, but they need to know where they should start first. And they want to know what works the best with the majority of kids. And people of my generation will all say, I learned on phonics. It worked fine. Mm -hmm. Why did we ever make a change? Wasn't there, do you remember (laughs) Hooked on Phonics, which was when I was a kid? It was like the help workbook they advertised on like Nickelodeon. But yeah, Yeah, I I mean, go ahead. I I mean, look, for, for, for somebody that grew up on phonics, it worked. I learned to read quickly and I was a proficient reader in school. But having these conversations with the teacher, it makes clear that it doesn't work for everybody. Look, dyslexia gets in the way of phonics, and it's a very complicated thing to deal with. I I appreciate that 
DeWine is upset about the proficiency of reading and, and, and putting more money into it to try and do something about it is great. I just don't like the idea of prescribing the method. If, if he's saying, I want to prop up the people that want to use this method and provide them with some extra money because I think kids could benefit all well and good. But if you're picking up a hammer to say my way or the highway, that's not the way education should work. No. And Laura Hancock did a really nice story on this really deep dive and talked to a lot of people. Um, the Ohio Department of Education has updated literary guide literacy guidance. It reflects the latest and best research. It's encouraging schools to use the science of reading. The Ohio Education Association, that's the teachers union. They don't generally get involved into which method because they say things are dramatically oversimplified for political purposes. Wait, um, what? <laughs> like, of course <laughs> they do this, right? So he's saying, I don't know of any teachers who are 100% pro phonics or anti phonics, pro whole language or anti. And I think that's exactly what we've said, right? Teachers are out to figure out the best way for kids. But DeWine, I mean, glad he's putting some money into this. We got to see what the legislature is going to follow up. But he wants $64 million to pay for the science of reading curricula, $43 million for the next two years to provide instruction for educators, including stipends, and $12 million to support 100 literacy coaches in schools and districts focusing on schools with the lowest literacy proficiency rates. I mean, these kids, third grade, they take the, the test I believe they take it in the fall of third grade and then the official t- test is in the spring. So if your fall numbers are not good enough, they got a, a, a bunch of time to get you into really rigorous instruction after school help, in school help to get you where you need to go. But not every district has that kind of resources yeah. and hopefully this will help. Well, we, we obviously cannot do justice to this debate in a six minute segment on the podcast. As Laura said, Laura Hancock's story really does set the table for everything you need to know about it. Uh, Laura, you ought to put a link to that story into the post that goes with this podcast. People should read it, especially anybody that has students in the schools. You're listening to Today in Ohio. This is the week where the Larry Householder trial busted open with revelations, and it's only Wednesday morning. What was the black ops plan described in Testimony Tuesday designed to thwart the ability of voters to have a say on the corrupt billion dollar bailout of the aging nuclear plants? Lisa, this is a fun trial to be paying attention to. (laughs) And we've kind of talked about this black ops, you know, thing in our podcast last week. But testimony from uh, former lobbyist Juan Cespedes continued yesterday, and he offered up more details about infiltrating the campaign to repeal House Bill. Bill 6. So Suspedis and First Energy Solutions lobbyist Matt Borges, aka Defendant, hatched a plan to get information from the repeal campaign manager, Tyler Furman, who is a friend of Borges. And, uh, you know, Suspedis said the idea was to compensate Furman for helpful information, but they kept this plan from their bosses at First Energy Solutions. They accidentally revealed it to an executive, uh, executive chair, John Kiani, in a conference call and uh, using the term black ops. But Kiani, when told, you know, what was going on, he says, well, do whatever it takes to get it done. So there was an August 2019 text from Kiani to Suspedis that referred to this operation as a black ops strategy. Uh, This text was previously seen by the jury. Um, There was a September 2019 payment to Tyler Furman. Um, It was $15,000, but both Borges and Suspedis worried that he would buy something flashy and make it harder to conceal the fact that he got this $15,000 check. I've, I've wondered whether we should do a special episode of this podcast to break down what's being presented into 10 key points, right? I've often thought that January 6th, nobody's really done that. Here's 10 ways people violated the law. Here's 10 things John, Donald Trump did that clearly put him in the jackpot for January 6th. We could do the same thing with this. This is overwhelming evidence of bad behavior, but there's so much in the weeds that I just wonder whether we could do a decent job of just taking a half hour and laying it out, making it clear. We also had a story yesterday about why prosecutors might be emphasizing the deleted records in this case. 
Right. And, and that's kind of their larger uh, strategy. They've already had three people testify about deleted documents, texts, and so forth. But Case Western Reserve University law professor Mike Benza says, uh, deleting evidence can show the defendants knew exactly what was going on and knew that these messages would prove that a crime occurred. Yeah. I mean, that it is very telling. You don't delete records unless you have a reason to hide them. Uh, it's a good story. It's all on cleveland.com. We're covering the heck out of this trial. You're listening to Today in Ohio. We've been talking about the lack of railroad transparency for a week as the residents of East Palestine worry about the long-term effects of what they are breathing involving the derailment. But now Governor Mike DeWine is complaining about the secrecy, too. Courtney, what did he say Tuesday? Yeah, he came out and gave us an update along with some other state officials on the state of things in East Palestine. And, you know, as part of that, DeWine said that under federal law, the railroad operator wasn't, you know, required to alert the state about what they were carrying in those cars. So DeWine kind of called on Congress and pointed to the federal government and asked, them to make changes about this notification procedure. But in in the meantime, we did get a kind of a healthy update about where things stand. But I don't know, some, some troubling question marks would remain for me if I was a resident of that area. You know, we heard from Ohio EPA director Ann Vogel, and she reported on this plume of chemicals from that initial release when they when they blew up the car when it or they were avoiding an explosion by setting fire to the derailed tanks and and Ann Vogel said this this plume of chemicals is currently making its way down the Ohio River. It's currently near Huntington, West Virginia, moving at about one mile an hour. But she said the contaminate the contaminants that are in the water are at a low level. And and she said that water treatment methods that treat everyone's, you know, municipal water s- sources, that should remove any contaminants. She said they were pretty confident that contaminants would not make their way through that process and, and go on to consumers. You know, at the same time, the director of the Ohio Department of Health is is recommending that that people around the derailment should use bottled water while they continue to conduct testing and monitor municipal water sources. Yeah. yeah, what bothered me about what Bruce Vanderhoff had to say, he was talking about the fumes that they're breathing because everybody's smelling this stuff. And he's saying, you know, this is just like when you're pumping gas and you smell volatile compounds. And yes, okay. And if you're doing furniture refinishing and you smell some turpentine for a few minutes, yes, it's the same thing. These people are breathing it 24 hours a day. There's a difference in in that. And I was a little bit surprised at the kind of tossing it off, saying, yeah, the air quality isn't that bad. If you can smell the volatile substances, you're breathing them. And there is a worry about about that. Some of these things do cause cancer. Uh, one of our uh, texting, uh, the people I text with each day sent me a clip from 2019 in which the federal government was cracking down on the railroads to stop this kind of thing. And the Donald Trump administration pulled back all the regulations. So that would explain a little bit about what we're right. seeing. I just read that that you sent me. I had no idea these giant trains, you know, that take minutes to go by as you sit in your car and watch at a train crossing, have one crew member on them. One. Right. Isn't right. that just maddening? Like, that's a whole lot of cargo to be, you know, in charge of by one person. Right. And that, and they were going to be required to have two, and Donald Trump stopped it. It, it is time for the federal government to require complete transparency. If a train derails, it ought to be automatic that we learn everything that's on that train. And the fact that that still has not happened here is distressing in the extreme. It's today in Ohio. The algal bloom that shut down Toledo's water supply for a few days a few years back was supposed to be a wake-up call for the Great Lakes states to stop farm runoff from continuing to feed all this algae. Ohio is doing a bad job, it seems. Laura, what's the latest? 
Yeah, this is not surprising at all, but it is good to see someone's doing a report on it, that it's from the Alliance for the Great Lakes and the Ohio Environmental Council. So back in 2015, Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario committed to a 40% reduction in total phosphorus inputs to the lake by 2025. That's in two years. By 2017, we were already behind. And this new study says Ohio and Michigan have absolutely zero chance of meeting the goal the way that it's going. That's significant changes are needed to attack the problem. I mean, the percentages that they put on this is we, we need to spend another $250 million a year in Ohio, an eightfold increase of infield practices within the farm fields themselves, and a 25-fold increase in the practices on the edge of fields. Because if you remember, our program here is voluntary. It's called H2 Ohio. And the idea is we're going to try to stop this phosphorus runoff from farms, mainly in the Maumee River watershed, south of Toledo, and mainly from fertilizer and manure, all this, that we're going to try and stop them by doing no-till farming, by putting less fertilizer in, by, by not spreading it when the ground is frozen, and putting in things to catch it, basins and everything, so that uh, wetlands, so that it could be absorbed before it gets into the lake. But not enough farmers are participating. They are actually paid to participate in this program, but we only have about a 35% buy-in. It's about 1.5 million acres in those watershed. And the thing is about this report, it doesn't say how Ontario is doing, so I don't know. Um, And also Indiana is a big part of this problem because there's a lot of farms on the western edge of Indiana that feed into the watershed that I don't even know if they're required to do anything. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was during the John Kasich administration where you had state regulators saying, we're not even sure it's phosphorus that's doing this, which is astounding because it clearly was the phosphorus that's mm-hmm. doing it. What, at some point, you've got to pick up a stick. It's got to stop. We're poisoning the lake. We're making yes. it, uh, the, the water is it, it threatened. And I, it's kind of a shock that here we are, 2023, and we're not really forcing farmers to take the steps they need to stop this. No, and this is, It's such a massive problem, but the agriculture industry is really powerful. They have a lot of lobbyists. It's not just the farm fields. Uh, Talk about confined animal feeding operations. You don't even have to have a permit for those until you're over a, a giant number of livestock in each one of your barns. And that's just where they're kept inside and their poop is just piled up. And so that contributes. And so the farmers will point fingers at the cities and say, well, you're just, you know, disposing your wastewater into the lake. But we all know that those treatment plans are really doing a good job of getting all of the, all of the stuff out before it's going in the lake. And this stuff just goes straight into the ground, seeps into the water and goes out into the lake. And that's what causes that causes that mucky, scummy green on the surface. And, and also one thing that wasn't considered in 2015 was how bad climate change is getting and how bad the storms are every time. So the, the heavier it rains, the more soil is going into the lake, the worse it is. Given that Mike DeWine dealt with the green energy issue by declaring <laughs> natural gas to be green energy, maybe what we're going to see him do is declare algae as a new Ohio cash crop, and then oh we God. can seek to grow more of it. I mean, if we're going to be preposterous with green energy, let's be preposterous with algae. Hey, You're maybe listening. J.D. Vance is going to fix it with his Great Lakes Caucus. Yeah, we'll be getting to that. Where. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Let's stick with the water. Ohio is getting a ton of money to deal with forever chemicals in drinking water. Lisa, I'd like to ask you what they're going to use the money for, although the details are scarce, but at least you know where they're going to focus it. That's correct. Yeah, the uh, the Ohio is getting forty six point five million dollars from the EPA to protect against these so called forever chemicals in rural, small, and or disadvantaged communities throughout the state. This money comes from the bipartisan infrastructure law and will be distributed through an EPA grant program. So the forever chemicals they're focusing on because there are a lot of them, but this one, these two are perfluoroalkyl and polyfluoroalkyl or PFAs used in a lot of products, including stain resistant fab- fabrics. And the, the base elements that make up these chemicals, carbon and fluorine, once they're bound together chemically, they're almost impossible to separate. So they last in the environment for a really long time and they are a health hazard. They leach into landfills, they leach into water supplies, and they can travel long distances by air. And then they're brought back to earth by rain or other precipitation. 
So uh, in June, they EPI had, EPA had a health advisory on two other forever chemicals, PFOs and PFOA. Uh, they're not used, and they they've been you know not used for years, but they're still in the environment. Yeah, I just wish there was more detail on how you stop it. I, I the the it, it seems like this is a insidious problem and it's difficult to deal with when I've was doing some research on it for the homeowner. It's just basically use water filters because it's coming in and I don't really have a good feel for how they're going to spend this money. Well, and I don't know what the science is and how they, are they keeping it out of the water supply? I assume that they are, but uh, EPI, EPA, I keep saying EPA, EPA uh, officials say these emerging contaminants are some of the greatest environmental challenges they face. Okay. You're listening to Today in Ohio. How is Cuyahoga County Council taking a step that might help the impoverished city of East Cleveland after almost taking a step that might have been a big mistake, Courtney? Yeah, so let's, uh, you know, set set the scene here. A few months ago, under former county executive Armin Budish, the county was looking to offload, sell this now vacant property um, from the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities. It's on Euclid Avenue in East Cleveland. And that original plan from months ago was to sell the building to a for-profit corporation whose owner has, you know, family ties to a liquor store down the street. And other entities that were had submitted bids and proposals to use this property for their own purposes, they kind of raised some concerns and the county backed off that proposed deal. You know, they basically said that the liquor store tied to this LLC was, wasn't doing good for the community and that it sounds like eroded their faith in, in its ability to usher this property into its next beneficial life for the, the residents of East Cleveland. So fast forward to yesterday and county council approved the sale to a different LLC. You know, the county is going to get a, a about $100,000 more for the property. And this new LLC, Genesis Global Holding, they want to transform this vacant building into retail space, a community center, potentially a grocery store, and up to 250 affordable housing units. Yeah, I, I when you saw what they were going to do, that wouldn't have been helpful to a city in such distress. But this could be an economic development boon. So credit the the county for trying to do the right thing here with the building. No, just that was the same thing that the councilwoman Cheryl Stevens, who represents that area, says. You know, East Cleveland needs affordable housing. This is an important step. You're listening to Today in Ohio. What is Cleveland State University's Project 400, and what is it aiming for this year, Laura? Well, this the 400 is named after 1619, the last time there was a, I believe that's the end of the slave trade. Or the first tra- slave trade, it was the New York Times project. Sorry, I should know that better. But dur- the conference is titled Our Mod- Bodies, Our Minds, Our Communities, Physical, Emotional, and Environmental Impacts of Racism. And so local and national speakers are going to address the impact of racism on mental health, redlining, the repeal of Roe versus Wade, and other challenges that face African Americans. So this was a year-long observation that CSU started in 1619. This was when, sorry, the first enslaved Africans brought to the British colonies of North America. So it's been 400 years since that started and, you know, 400, four years since t- the Project 400 started. And it's going to take place February 24th, 25th at 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And so both days are $10 and they have speakers from across the country and around from Cleveland, like Jasmine Long. She's the CEO of Birthing Beautiful Communities. And that's the Cleveland-based nonprofit that works to address the social determinants of infant mortality. So it should be an interesting two days of conversation. All right. You're listening to Today in Ohio. J.D. Vance is a senator in a Great Lakes state, but he is, after all, a brand new senator. Is it odd that he's a co-chair of the Senate's Great Lakes Task Force? And can such a polarizing figure as Vance work in a bipartisan manner on an issue so important to Ohio? Lisa, this one's full of contradictions. 
Oh, yeah. It, but yeah, I feel like there's a glimmer of hope here. But uh, yeah, J.D. Vance is actually co-chair of the Senate Great Lakes Task Force, replacing Rob Portman, who used to be on there. Um, he was invited by the other co-chair, Debbie Stabenow, who is a Democrat from Michigan. Um, they had a nice talk and uh, you know they had a very productive meeting about Great Lakes issues. So he was invited to come aboard and he said he's glad to do it. His priorities for Lake Erie are in the Great Lakes is fighting Asian carp and other invasive uh, flora and fauna, repairing the aging lock systems, and then fully funding the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And he hopes for bipartisan cooperation on this initiative without the usual political rancor. He says he wants to be an ambassador for Great Lakes economic development, and he says that Ohio deserves a bipartisan whole of government approach to keeping our Great Lakes pristine. But we just talked about the algae, which to fix that will require restrictions on agriculture. And he is a staunch far right kind of guy that doesn't like restrictions on any kind of business. Where do you think he'll come down on that? It's a rhetorical question. We have no idea. Right. But he did not list, you know, pollution, you know, from runoff as one of his priorities. So we'll have to see. Yeah, he but, also, then, go but ahead. that would be bad for Ohio because that's a big problem, right? Exactly. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt right now. He says he's having a lot of fun as senator, especially dealing with constituents. But he says he's still going to fight the big issues. And he said that Biden should have shot down that Chinese spy balloon earlier. Okay, you're listening to Today in Ohio. Our newsroom had a long conversation with Cleveland City Council President Blaine Griffin this week. Courtney, you also spent a day during budget hearings yesterday hearing a lot of his thoughts on where the city stands, particularly with regard to policing. So what are the highlights of our conversations with Mr. Griffin? Yeah, so when we were talking over Mayor Justin Bibb's budget proposal for 2023, It cuts out some 140 unfilled police vacancies and 150 other vacancies across City Hall. These are positions that haven't been filled for years, according to Bibb. And so this is kind of the big talking point about this year's budget. Uh, Bibb says that that was needed to be able to arrive at a structurally balanced budget. So when we talked to Council President Blaine Griffin, he said he, you know, he was open to thinking about having a realistic number and budgeting for the reality of the staff that we have instead of, you know, essentially an aspirational number that the city hasn't been able to recruit and fill those slots for a while. So he seemed to be on board with some of that. However, you know, Blaine Griffin told us that Yes, he's he he thinks that that a balanced budget is important, but at the same time he talks about there being a lot of need and 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 desire for for more city services, right? So he he's questioning whether the city maybe ought to dip into some of its reserve cash and and that would likely mean not a structurally balanced budget, right? Um to 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 supplement city operations. He didn't say it specifically, but maybe those basic city services are increasing the number of police back up or, or just other things, public works projects, strategic initiatives. So I, I'm very curious to kind of see how this balance goes. Yesterday, Councilman Kevin Conwell asked Bib, as we're negotiating this budget in the coming weeks, what's non-negotiable for you? And and Pip seemed to offer one line in the sand, really pointing to that structurally balanced budget as his non-negotiable. So as council weighs, whether it wants to dip into reserves or move some of this money around, I'm, I'm curious to see what those decisions are. At some point, yeah, the council is going to have to finalize here and decide which way it wants to go. It, 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 it what's odd is he's arguing that if you take money out of the rainy day fund, you're somehow structurally not balanced. If the city council decides we don't need that fund to be as big as it is and moves the money in, you're still balanced. What I loved about this discussion is you got Bib on the one side saying we cannot fill all our police positions fast enough. We're way behind. And part of the reason is we don't pay well. So if I wipe a bunch of those empty positions off the budget and free up the money that's committed to them, I can give raises to police. I can create a schedule where the new officers get to decent salaries quicker and make those jobs more attractive to fill the openings we have. But then 
On the other side, you got Blaine Griffin saying, okay, but how does that reduce violence? And how does that restaff the homicide department, which has not a good solve rate? How does this reduce crime? And you don't really have the middle. Lisa, I, you, you really had not had a chance to hear from Blaine Griffin before. So it was one of the reasons we had him speak to the editorial board. What was your mm-hmm. takeaway? Um, yeah, he kind of said that he said that officers are burnt out, you know, staffing levels are not optimal. And he said that, you know, once you take those police positions away, as Bib is proposing, it would be really hard to get them back. And, you know, so yeah, it was interesting, not that he was exactly in opposition, but he gave me a better perspective of, you know, exactly what's going on in city hall. Yeah, and if if you don't mind, some of some of his concerns do have to do with burnout. One lingering question here is: Is this move going to force officers to move into twelve-hour shifts, which could mm-hmm. increase the risk of burnout? Like you said, uh, the homicide units been historically understaffed. Our our solve rate is up now in line with the national average, but sex crimes is understaffed. And he just wondered how these moves are going to fa- affect things that that affect everyday Clevelanders. You know. Courtney, for for many, many years, the city council was kind of a patsy for the mayor. Not since the days when Mike Polensic was city council president have you had tight oversight. The years when Marty Sweeney was there, he pretty much did what Frank Jackson wanted. The years Kevin Kelly was there, he pretty much did what Frank Jackson wanted. Are you getting a sense that under Blaine Griffin that there is going to be some real discussion that the the council will assert itself and alter this budget? Or do you think they'll pretty much fall in line with what Vib wants? You know, I think last year council was, was, um, you know, eager and, 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 and down with letting the new mayor kind of carve his path and, and allowed him to get up and running. I get the sense that this year, it's going to be a little bit more of that back and forth, right? I don't know what council's going to ultimately do with this proposal, but I think it's a little bit, you know, Mike Polenzik maybe phrased it this way a few weeks ago, the honeymoon's over. I think that oversight's going to ramp up this year. Not that it wasn't happening last year. You know, council members are are vocal, and and but but I think we're going to see that that continue throughout this year. But that's healthy, I, I- right? You want that back and forth. Yeah, I don't get the impression that it's confrontation or resistance for the sake of confrontation or resistance. When you listen to Blaine Griffin talk, you're hearing genuine concerns from a guy that has the historical institutional knowledge that the mayor doesn't necessarily have. So, yes, if if they do this in a constructive way, which is what it sounded like to me, then this is what we need. That's the way government's supposed to work. and, And we could end up in a good place. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel to me like it's like nasty or adversarial, like you said, for just the sake of it. These are real points. And council members are right when they say one of the top things they hear from their residents is public safety. I hear it just talking to neighbors and folks around town. So so they're they're keying in on some real issues that probably ought to be debated here. All right, we've gone a little bit long because we wanted to take advantage of Courtney's presence on the podcast. You're listening to Today in Ohio. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Laura. Thanks to everybody who listens. 